Okay, good day. My name is Zosha de Saskovasnitsky Gruber, and I'm the Policy Director and Gender Specialist at the Good British Columbia Council for International Cooperation. It is an absolute honor to moderate this session on a topic that is very close to my heart. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge that BCCIC's work takes place on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, Selvatooth, and Tsuwasa nations. And I make this acknowledgement to pay our profound respects to the host of this land for their stewardship for time immemorial and to remind ourselves of both their history and their present day contributions to our society as a whole. So in partnership with BCCIC, Hope International Development Agency and FIDEA, this is focus women's agency and leadership in localized solutions to climate change, environmental and disaster risk reduction in four countries, Canada, Haiti, Pakistan and Sri Lanka, all of our speakers were nominated for their leadership in their local community. And in our panel format, we'll discuss some of the challenges that they're facing in promoting climate change solutions and advancing gender equality and how they're overcoming the barriers that they face. Now, there are several important housekeeping issues I'd like to raise. It's important to note that our speakers are calling in from communities where connectivity is, an, is a challenge. And some of them are actually dealing with power cuts at the moment, as well as other technical issues. So if there is a technical issue or disruption, please be patient and please be empathetic. In terms of language, we are being assisted by a translator um, who will be helping our speaker from Haiti translate from French Creole to English. But in general, the session is only being offered in English. So please, at the bottom of your screen, where you see the little world or the little globe, click English. If you don't click English and you leave it on the French channel, you'll hear some back discussion between the interpreter and our speaker in Haiti. So please do click, click English. Um, in terms of the format of the session, we are hoping to have a conversational style panel discussion, and then we will follow with Q&A afterwards. Please use the Q&A function of the webinar at the bottom to um, ask your questions, or you're welcome to include your questions and comments in the comment box, the chat box. On that note, I'm going to hope that we have resolved all our technical issues, and I am going to introduce our amazing speakers. So first, let me start with Squaquash Sunshine Dunstan Moore, who's from Vidia. So she's a Community Climate Justice Coordinator, as well as a member of the Youth Advisory Group with the Canadian Commission for UNESCO. Thank you. Lo lovely to see you, Sunshine. Um, then I'm, oh, it's wonderful to see Dr. Rabina, who's been having some issues with her camera this morning. Fantastic to see your face. Um, Dr. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I am so happy for that. Yeah. <laughs> Finally, my technical you know, expert fixed that problem. Fantastic. Dr. Rabina Faroz Bhatti, she is a human rights activist and a leadership consultant with over 20 years of experience in Pakistan. She's the founder of the executive director of Tam Wasif organization, and she was actually nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, as well as for the Women of Courage Award at various points in her career. And currently she's, work, she's a member of the National Commission on the Rights of the Child, and she's consulting for the Ministry for Human Rights and Minority Affairs. Our next esteemed speaker is Dr. Carla Perez, who's a university lecturer and a gender specialist in the development sector. She's been working there for over 27 years on different policy issues related to gender and grassroots communities. She's also a board member of the Center for Women's Research and the head of the SIATH Foundation, as well as a board member of the Sri Lanka Center for Development Facilitation. And our last speaker from Haiti is Fernand Alcide, Fernanda is an agro science, agronomic sciences student at the American U University of the Caribbean. And she's a member of the KPG Agricultural Cooperative, where she's been involved in various different activities promoting gender equality and um, climate change solutions. So I'm going to start the panel with Fernand. Fernand, what are the effects of climate change and environmental disasters on women and girls in your local rural communities? La communauté peut faire face avec des défis pour un nouveau diocèse. Les catastrophes naturelles, 
quand ils ont déplacé bien loin pour aller chercher de l'eau pour utiliser chaque jour. Okay, I'm struggling to hear the translation. In my community, women face a lot of challenges, especially um, when we have um, when we have disaster, and then we need to find water. So the women in my community need to go very far to find this water in dry seasons, because usually in the natural disaster, the reservoirs used to used to be broke so we have to find water very very far and after that those water are, are stuck it in some tanks and those tanks are not um covered so this water used to be um used to be contaminated and is it used to give us um illness like itchy skin or infection infect uni, uni, urinary infections and that kind of stuff so we have a lot of problem with water after this kind of disasters i'm sure that must make it very difficult for women who are caring for children for the elderly and for other sick members of their families and um, rubina in pakistan what are the effects of climate change on women in your local communities? And do you share some of the health concerns that were raised by Fernand in Haiti? Oh, you're muted. Can you repeat the question, please? I didn't hear you well. Oh, um, no, no problem. Um, Rubina, what are the... What are the effects of climate change um, and, in, and disasters on women in your communities? And do you share some of the same concerns about health that have been raised by Prof. Fernand? Thank you so very much. And it's an honor to be with you all. And uh, now talking about the effects of climate change on women uh, in Pakistan, women and girls in Pakistan, of course, it is important to understand the context of Pakistan, where these women live and have been facing the multiple effects of climate change. Pakistan is one of the most vulnerable country. It has been ranked the fifth most effective, affected country in the world, though it contributes a very little to global greenhouse gas emissions, just 0.9%. Pakistan is currently witnessing severe heat waves, landslides, floods, droughts, forest fire, and displaced population. This all resulted in reduction in the agricultural productivity and water availability. Now, talking about the impacts of climate change uh, on women and girls, first of all, we have to comprehend that uh, Climate change is not gender neutral. It is of course affecting all of us, but it affects certain groups more than others. When we talk about local rural communities, this is one of the most marginalized group, but within these rural communities, women are further marginalized due to intersectionality of gender, culture, religion, and class. This is what I'm talking about, you know, in, uh, in uh, about women in my context. Climate change has both direct and indirect effects on women in Pakistan. When we talk about the direct effects, um, of course, women living in rural areas of Pakistan tend to feel impact of climate change more aggressively due to assigned traditional roles, gender roles and responsibility. Let me give you an example. If they are solely accountable for the essential domestic tasks, um, uh, like uh, uh, you know, collecting firewoods or um, water, if there is a depletion of uh, natural resources, if there is a depletion of water or wood, then it will affect women more. Now, in the coastal area of Sin, women have to walk two to three kilometers and sometimes multiple times a day to collect water. And um, it affects their health, you know, uh, uh, the, it affects their health badly. And this is somehow indirectly when you, you are uh, affected by the climate change that of course, 
your health is also deteriorating further. They, these women who collect um, water and who collect water, uh, I mean, on, on heavy metal parts full of water on their uh, heads, they have severe back pain, they have headache, they have hair loss. And uh, in Pakistan, large number of women, you can say between 50 to 80 percent are food producer, while 70 percent of livestock is also managed by women in rural areas. Now, if women, uh, you know, like uh, if their uh, um, work or their agricultural contribution is already, you know, uh, overlooked and unrecognized uh, in the by the labor department and uh, of course, by, even within the families and the society. Now, if they the, their livelihood is entirely at the risk, of course, climate have made the livelihood of the entire family or uh, entire population uh, very challenging. But if the income, if they don't have the alternative livelihoods, or if they have uh, less income, then it will affect women more. It will affect girls more. The family will pick the boys uh, to spend the whatever resources they do have on the health and the education and you know the other needs of the boys rather than the girls so these are some of you know uh, the situation in pakistan thank you thank you rabina kana in sri lanka have you seen similar direct and indirect effects on women's health as well as on their livelihoods as a result of climate change very much, uh, very similar to what Rabina has just explained. And in Sri Lanka also, the majority of our population is in rural areas. And most of our women in rural areas are involved in uh, small scale farming, uh, agricultural activities, uh, then inland fisheries. Now the rural lifestyle has changed so much, the, the kind of impact uh, experience during the last few decades is uh, has called for so mu so much of change, creating much distortion challenges to the triple rule of women. Women who would have been involved in agricultural practices with their gut feeling just by looking at the sky and uh, watching the shapes of the cloud, the clouds are not the same for them anymore. They are, they are traditional practices or judging the environment and getting involved with their work has been challenged. And what is, what is the real impact? People who have spent time, women who have spent time planned for certain activities may have to be changed. Now, unexpected rain, unexpected floods and longer dry seasons without rain is making women to change their rural lifestyle. Well, therefore, as Slabina was very correctly mentioned, the impact of climate change is disproportionate on women compared to men. This is a reality. This is a this is an experience. And uh, since I was talking about the distortion or the changes or the shifts in the triple role of women, the, the challenges, the marginalization, the vulnerabilities felt are greater in Sri Lanka. So therefore, just as the, the explanations given, Sri Lankan women, rural women are highly affected uh, with the changes in the climate. Thank you, Carla. Sunshine, you're calling to us from Lytton in Canada. Are women experiencing similar effects to climate change in your community? Yeah, thank you. Um, actually, currently I'm calling in from Harrison because I am still evacuated. Um, growing up, I have experienced numerous different effects of climate change from wildflowers, flooding, heat waves, and even more recently landslides that we're still dealing with. So my hometown, Lytton, its traditional name is called Kumshing, which means where the two rivers meet. And so we have two rivers that surround the town. And one of the main things growing up I remember seeing is flooding. <coughs> Sorry for my dog. Um, so there's two parts of town and to, to, what connects them is a small two car ferry. And 10 years ago, when flooding would happen, 
the ferry would be out for about two weeks. But more recently, just last year, it's now like being closed for two months. So that we've seen a drastic change in how long flooding lasts. And just last year, Southern British Columbia went through a heat wave where we were seeing temperatures of 40 plus degrees Celsius, but within Lytton, we had four days of extreme heat of 50 plus degrees, which on its fourth day ignited what's known as the Lytton Creek fire, which burnt down 90% of the town. So I'm currently still evacuated and there is, I haven't heard of when I will be able to return yet. Sunshine, how were women and girls in particular affected by the fire? Yeah, so women, girls, and gender diverse folks are often the caretakers, I, I think, pretty much everywhere. And what I've noticed a big gap within, especially Latin, is healthcare, mental healthcare, and support, um, especially outside support, because women, girls, and gender diverse folks are the caretakers. There's there's a gap within ensuring that the stuff that they are doing, their, their tasks are being taken care of and so they are able to take care of themselves as well. Thank you, Sunshine. I'm glad that you mentioned women's role in the care economy. This is a priority for the Canadian government at the moment. Fernand, um, we've heard a lot about the challenges and the disproportionate effects of climate change and disasters on women and girls in the different countries. But how are women in your community developing local solutions to some of these challenges? Can you provide any examples of the local solutions that women are leading or developing in Haiti? <laughs> Um, in my community, we learn to organize our families um, because of the climate changes and because of the uh, natural disaster. We, we work to adapt ourselves to those changes and we use agricultural techniques to adapt to those changes. For example, we try to produce more food who don't need so much water because of the dry seasons, um, those products can even be harvested in those dry seasons, can be planted and harvested. For example, we have cassava or pigeon beans that we plant because they don't require too much water. Thank you. Uh, it's very interesting to hear how women are changing their agricultural practices and developing nature-based and localized solutions. Rubina, in your community, how are women coming up with solutions to some of the challenges that you described in Pakistan? Yeah, uh, in Pakistan, of course, uh, rural women, uh, you know, women belonging to rural community, uh, particularly and women in general, they both have been working and finding solutions, how they can cope with the crisis of climate change and you know effects of climate change. And um, they have been, uh, uh, you know, applying to a two-prong, you know, approach. First, they, they are trying to uh, ensure and increase their engagement in policy dialogue. And the second approach is to, as you know, um, make a shift towards the alternative livelihoods. Now, let me talk about the engagement in policy dialogue. Uh, at various, uh, you know, pl platforms, women are coming together. They have been engaging experts from academia, health, business women, water specialist, uh, uh, you know, to discuss the issues what women really have been facing because of the climate change. Uh, in the capital Islamabad, there is a, a very good uh, you know, policy forum or a network of women, which we call Women Water Network. And they not only engage the uh, women living in urban setting, but also uh, uh, women from uh, rural communities, they have been sharing their experiences that how they can protect the water reservoirs and cheat water, uh, wastewater before it, uh, its um, interaction with the environment. And the other thing when we talk about that, um, 
they have been uh, struggling to make uh, like alternative livelihoods. Of course, many NGOs or some I NGOs, um, they are supporting those uh, rural women, for instance. Um, Oxfam has initiated a program which we call We Care Program. And um, it, it, it's based on four R's, um, recognition, reduction, uh, redistribution and repre representation. Through the establishment of uh, women kitchen gardening, water governance and other burden sharing tasks. They, of course, the first thing is women have to recognize that they are the most affected group and uh, climate change is, is a serious issue and it, it will become further serious in coming, uh, you know, uh, coming years or coming days. And then how they can reduce and what kind of um, uh, you know, resources they want to distribute. And uh, when we talk about the representation of women, it means the presence of women at all levels. It must be at the local level, when we talk about local level, at the village level, at, in the city councils, at the district level, at provincial level, you know, at the national level. So if women are present there, then they will, they will really raise their voice whatever the programs or policies will be designed uh, to, uh, to minimize or to reduce the effects of climate change. Now, uh, I, I would also like to mention how government is uh, coordinating and how um, supporting these women living in the periphery districts and in, in the far-flung rural communities. Government of Pakistan has a very ambitious and very good program, which we call 10 Billion Trees Tsunami Program. And under this program, the women are also getting a kind of livelihood opportunity because when they start plantation, the government has been intentionally engaging women in tree plantation. And this is a way of, uh, uh, having a livelihood opportunity. The second program which government has introduced is SAS program. And uh, SAS program is providing grants and uh, no interest loans to women uh, for initiating a kind of alternative uh, livelihoods and some eco-friendly businesses um, uh, sometimes like online marketing. So all this is going with what government has been doing for the women. So somehow there are some opportunities. I am not saying that everything is rosy, for instance, to get the access to all these resources and uh, to create the really sustainable synergies and sustainable programs is a big, bigger challenge, but you can say maybe it's a baby step towards the right direction. Yeah. Thank you, Rabina. That's very interesting. Um, it's wonderful to see how organizations and international organizations and the government are creating opportunities for rural women and um, through various measures such as social protection schemes and microloans actually supporting rural women. Um, but Carla, if we go back to the question about rural women developing solutions for themselves. Do you have any examples in local communities where women are assuming the leadership and coming up with innovative ideas to deal with climate change? Yeah, very much. Uh, women at the receive, not just to be at the receiving end, but to lead the process. Uh, we see two main perspectives here. Uh, to, to face the challenges of climate change, using local knowledge, and collectivity, collective action of women working together. Now, uh, when you ask for the examples, let me just say, before they look for their alternatives, women, the caregivers, they switch on to their survival mode. And in the survival mode, they try to gain the maximum by going, looking at their, considering their native practices, uh, look for productive and sustainable practices, they try to uh, preserve food. And once again, what has been there and what has been done with the traditional knowledge plus with local resources. As one example, we import a lot of cereals for children, but there are collectives which have got the knowledge to come up with local cereal. 
with by mixing different local grains locally produced have out of harvest their own harvest nutritious as i mean like anything else then the use of low local material women use local material uh, as alternatives as well as to uh, face the impact of climate change directly and indirectly felt and they also voice out their concerns not as individuals when they are individuals they are hardly heard but amplifying their voices through women's collectives and especially in livelihood activities when their small products whatever they are harvest cannot be sold when they don't have a bargaining power in in communities they collect the harvest they collect their produce and uh, make out a, a voice for them where they gain a bit of bargaining power and in terms of crop rotation and adapt adapting to better varieties and in terms of resilience women in working collectives promoting division of labor and working with each other for greater harvest or greater productivity effectiveness and efficiency so uh, examples like women working along uh, river beds and lagoons to plant mangroves we work with communities where women collect those small tiny samples uh, of uh, trees seeds during the wet season and they nurture and take care of these small plants and handed over back for reforestation programs so there are many different uh, types of initiatives small tiny but there are best practices which uh, the these best practices promoting local knowledge native practices and collective action of rural women in sri lanka Thank you, Kana. It's wonderful to see the power of collectives and women's collective organization in terms of finding alternative livelihoods, in terms of enhancing their bargaining power, and in terms of dealing with reforestation and so forth. Um, I just want to pose what you've just said now around um, traditional knowledge. Sunshine, I know that FIDEA works extensively with uh, youth and women and gender diverse people around um, harnessing or promoting um, traditional knowledge and traditional practices as solutions to climate change. Can you elaborate a bit more on some of this work? Yeah, so one of the projects we're actually working on right now is a food sovereignty project. Uh, this is along with the climate team. It is four communities. There is six of us or seven. I always lose track of the team, um, but it's a mycelium network and we're doing several activities, but one of the activities that I'll explain right now is we're providing mushroom growing kits to our communities, which mushrooms that are native to our land. And it's just to promote how to grow your own food and to teach youth and children on how to like grow mushrooms. And another thing we're doing is hiring local knowledge keepers to bring community members out to forage for local mushrooms and just to kind of teach them and show them where the good mushrooms are, hopefully. Um, and in Latin, who's coordinating for my community is myself, along with my colleague, Patashi and but it is support with the whole climate team wow um i've never thought of mushrooms and engaging with traditional knowledge around growing mushrooms as a form of food, adding to food security but also promoting gender equality um fernand in haiti does some of the examples that you provided around um, women's diverse agricultural practices do any of these climate solutions also promote gender equality and women's empowerment and leadership in local communities? Oui, la gueule est pas toujours bien assez pour yo fan. Et généralement, fan na marché c'est wol femme. Ça ba yo contrôle sou pomp ka rentre nan mer yo. Et ça vin fè ke yo vin gen contrôle sou fi yo. Donc yo pa oblige al pran yo nèg pou ba yo ou bien soit pour manger ou bien pour élever leur activité ça veut dire que le autonome ça veut dire que famille a bien plus contrôle sur vie pour prendre soin de tête et prendre soin de famille sorry i didn't hear the translator there 
Uh, is there a technical issue on your side? Okay, do you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay, usually when we are har harvesting on my community, there's always enough to sell. So, you know, in my community selling, it's a woman work. And when, when, they are, when they are harvesting and selling, selling those harvests, some, the thing is they are able to have the control on their income. And it's something very important because when those periods, when we have um, natural disaster or when we are touched by climate changes, it's very important to women to be able to take care of themselves, take care of their families, um, and they don't really have to marry a man to take care of them or to feed them. And that's make the women have more control in their lives and more control on what they can do to help their families. Thank you, Fernand. Um, Rubina, have you found that women's engagement in some of these agricultural and climate change solutions and practices actually has enhanced their empowerment and has enhanced their autonomy and control, as Fernanda has said? Yeah, it's very interesting that sometimes when we uh, when we think about some initiatives taken either by nonprofit organization, INGOs or government, we, we think that these are like kind of, uh, you know, directly affecting the, are directly supporting the climate change. But in the context of Pakistan, as I mentioned earlier, that some, some region, in some region of Pakistan, gender, uh, gender um, norms are, you can say the patriarchal mindset is so um, indrilled in the, in the cultural norms, like, uh, in some areas, even women could not get their national identity card or they can't have a right to vote uh, because, uh, you know, as, so if, if they don't have national identity card, it means they are not, they are nowhere, they are not in numbers. Mm -hmm. Their existence is basically the non-existence. So when the government started particularly the SAS program. This program is um, all based on technology, advanced technology, and it's linked with the national identity card and some other documents which really women need. These are the basic documents. So because of that, the first uh, step towards women empowerment or gender justice or gender equality is counting the women in, you know, uh, um, as a as a citizen of Pakistan, and uh, to giving them their identity. The second thing which which I believe in that women got um, empowered through this whole pro process with the, all these uh, uh, climate change initiative is that they learn how to work um, in coordination with the with the government sector and also with the uh, private sub sector. Uh, the knowledge sharing how they can form the uh, women groups, so, you know, women groups at the village level in, within their local communities and, the, uh, and how they can further integrate uh, towards the mainstream. So you can say from binding capital to um, bridging capital, you know, within, uh, within the women groups, then uh, like uh, with, the, with the mixed uh, communities and with the male sector of the society, male members of the society as well. So within this coordination, they have been running successful, eco-friendly, small businesses. Um, and the, the fourth point, you know, when they have to, uh, they have been engaged in such processes, their knowledge is, is enhanced, their skill is enhanced. And when the knowledge is enhanced, of course, the self-esteem, confidence, all these elements of public, uh, personal developments are the basic or the fundamental to the um, to the empowerment of women, and uh, this all lead towards nurturing women leadership. When they do, when they really are prepared to take part and um, to take part in different decision making structures, they have to learn. They have to develop with knowledge and skills. 
And this is what these um, initiatives have been working with the, you know, uh, uh, working with the women uh, have been contributing. Let me give, give you an example. For instance, I met a woman from Gilgit, Bilgistan, you know, Northern hilly area of Pakistan. And the woman, who, she told me that when we uh, when we learned about this concept of alternative livelihood, we met different women who were practicing uh, this kind of uh, mixed cropping and alternative cropping. So we went to their place and we learned knowledge. So this is a kind of woman woman trust relationship or you know support mechanism, and which they really could not get from maybe. Uh, at the early stage, if when their confidence and when their skills are not so, um, you know, boosted, maybe they could not get from the male member of their community, which they have been getting from other women. So mm -hmm. this is what I believe in, that within these all uh, initiatives, the, the journey towards um, uh, gender equality and social justice is on. Thank you. Uh, Rina, you really um, made me think about the different way in which we should conceptualize empowerment. Empowerment isn't, according to what you've said, isn't about organizations coming in or us coming in from Canada and teaching women, but it's actually about women teaching each other and learning and sharing with each other as a means of enhancing their skills, but also as a means of enhancing their self-esteem to promote gender equality. Carla, in terms of Sri Lanka, what is your experience? Has this work in climate change actually uh, served to enhance gender equality, or are they still being seen as two different streams in terms of gender equality and climate change? Yeah, in the system, when women's uh, a woman's presence is ignored, and also the environment is pressurizing them uh, to be cornered, to call themselves to be vulnerable, obviously it is a challenge. And also it has become a platform, this... Uh, climate change impact uh, to, to consider as a platform for women to get empowered, women to be mobilized, to work together through collective action, to find their own resilience. Uh, we have seen number of such initiatives because these initiatives are purposely trying to create space for women. And these initiatives are purposely addressing the practical and the strategic needs of women. Women who are challenged with the impact of climate change, trying to look at alternative sustainable practices, attending to their practical needs while they look for long-term change in their status. So surely these uh, initiatives, uh, women-led initiatives are very much uh, creating a platform for women to get specifically economically empowered as well as to improve their leadership and to intervene at most discriminatory uh, uh, spaces to voice out their concerns and to work towards their rights and social justice. In doing so, this whole process of social mobilization, of bringing women together, collective action, is creating the pathway for women to voice out their specific concerns. In terms of access and control over resources, in terms of uh, making the others, the community, the policy makers to listen to their suggestions, mm -hmm. for them to become the, a part of the decision making process, to intervene at the policy level and uh, to promote advocacy. So it's not easy, not, it is not just to get microcredit and to plant something new uh, targeting the ne next harvest. It is a long term process. So that is why I said these initiatives are addressing the practical and the strategic needs. And the interconnectedness do contribute uh, to the process in winning the rights of uh, our women in the rural sector, as also for uh, working towards social justice. Thank you, Carla. Um, Sunshine Vaidya works extensively around um, decolonizing knowledge and decolonizing the way that we look at empowerment. Is this done from a gendered lens? Like, can you see that some of the work you're doing, for instance, in terms of climate change is also promoting women's leadership, or promoting transform transformational change in relation to gender equality? 
Yeah. So for decolonization work, um, we are, we just did a decolonizing climate change and climate action. And because the sector is very male oriented and we're not trying to, how do I say this? We want more inclusion. That's, I think the main priority is to inclusify the space and definitely decolonize because science, science-based is very, like, I do believe, especially with pol climate policy, science, it should be science-based, but there should also be a consideration for indigenous knowledge because indigenous knowledge is ancestral. It has been around forever and it doesn't need to be backed up by science though because we indigenous people have been studying ecosystems forever basically and that's one thing that I, I believe we we do try to really promote and for leadership yes so um, the coordinators for Kumshin Latin is myself. I do, I am a cis woman. I go by she, her pronouns. And then my colleague Patashi is a two-spirited gender diverse person who goes by she, they pronouns. And especially with the um, disaster we went through last year, I have seen that many of our women and gender diverse people have been stepping up into those leadership roles to take care of our community on every level. Thank you, Sunshine. And I, I just like to draw the audience's attention to an incredible call to action that Sunshine and her colleague Shelby um, recently prepared around um, Indigenous young women's leadership and diverse gender persons leadership in the context of climate change. So my colleague will share that with you in the chat, but also she um, will share the decolonization toolkit that Vidya has prepared. Um, so, Fernand, uh, so we've heard that uh, climate, women are actually at the full, forefront of a lot of the climate change initiatives, and this is enhancing their um, ability to participate in public spaces, their ability to participate in decision making. But what are some of the challenges and barriers facing women in your community when they try to propose new solutions to climate change? And to the audience, please don't forget that um, for Fernand, when she's speaking, if you can please click English on the world button so that you can hear the translator speak. Okay, Fernand. Na chaque société, toujours gagne un défi entre trois garçons avec femmes. Um, in our society in Haiti, there's a lot of challenges between women and men voices. For example, uh, women voices are always underestimated, and it's easier, it's, it's not easy to women to make their voice be heard. And also, when it's about politics and in influence they can have on decisions about climate change. In our society, um, the women are always underestimated and people don't think women can take their own decisions. And their husbands and every man think women have to stay at home and take care of the house, take care of their child or take care of themselves. So women are very underestimated when it's about taking political uh, decisions um, for um, about climate changes. Thank you. Um, Rubina, do you find in Pakistan, um, you've already referred to some of the patriarchal norms um, and the position that this has left women in, but are there certain groups of women and girls that are more marginalized than others and face greater barriers when it comes yeah. to Yeah, let me talk. Yeah. When we talk about the you know challenges which women have been facing and barriers, of course the first thing is strong patriarchal society and it is uh, it it's not uh, like religion focused uh, you know 
women from majority, I mean, the Muslim, Pakistan is a Muslim country, a majority Muslim people are uh, residing over here. So it is, uh, patriarchy is everywhere, you know, in all religion. And it ranges from family to community. And but of course, if uh, if the INGOs, NGOs, or government, I mean both public or private sector, if they take initiative, uh, they could somehow um, uh, can make a dent in in this uh, patriarchal structures. For instance, within the SAS program, government made it mandatory that all kinds of cash grant or the relief, everything mm, during the pandemic, it will be given to women. And uh, so family was somehow uh, willingly or, or unwillingly, they supported and their women went and they get engaged and they got ID cards and they, they become a part of the system. Now, uh, when we talk about the challenges, the other is the financial dependency of women and it is also as you know, like women have it, uh, women are dependent on their brothers, husband, and you know, like fathers. So if they want to initiate a business, even they have to, uh, they have to get some support from the financial support from the family. But I really want to mention a certain group of women who are more marginalized. Let me give you an example. If, if like, uh, if there is a, a committee or a group. Um, managed or uh, sorry, made at the uh, is made at the village level for the water governance, and they intentionally make it mandatory to include women. I mean, talking. I am talking about the community group for water management. So, if they even make an intention, intentional or conscious decision to include women and minorities in that group, so what happens? The representation of uh, women is done by the women from majority. I mean, women from Muslim community, and the representation of minority is done by the minority men. So here, the you know the interplay of religion and gender goes hand in hand. And uh, now, the minority women they are you know. They are totally absent from that those decision making structures. Mm -hmm. So definitely, we need to take some extra affirmative action, some additional affirmative action to include the most marginalized women. Either they are minority women or they are the women with the uh, you know with disabilities or with special needs or the widows are uh, you know divorcee. Like sometimes in, in the patriarchal culture. Videos are uh, divorce are somehow stigmatized. So, in inclusion of those women, either they are from majority group or the minority group. If they are, um, if they are um, divorcee or they are the single mothers, then they they have to face an other set of barriers or challenges. So all this is going, you know. As, uh, and finally, what I will say that women are traditionally not trained in disaster management and they have to bear the burnt of natural calamities with more casualties as compared to men. And uh, the leadership, uh, when we talk about the uh, development of leadership or nurturing the leadership among women, we have to make take special measures to nurture the leadership among the most excluded women. Thank you, so, you know, as I mentioned, yeah. Yeah, so that is definitely in line with the Sustainable Development Goals Leave No One Behind pledge, help those furthest behind. Carla, have you found that certain um, groups of women are more marginalized um, or face greater barriers in getting involved in climate change solutions? Yeah, in principle, women are uh, not excluded, but not recognized. Uh, in climate change uh, uh, interventions. You know why? Because they don't have scientifically proven thoughts, but they have thoughts and suggestions which they have proved by living in a system, experiencing, which may not have the same value as scientifically proven. And these most of these rural women are not uh, uh, educated. They're not, they're not uneducated, but they don't hold all these, you know, uh, qualifications as such. 
which becomes a problem, which becomes a challenge in terms of getting their voices being heard. Now, we have seen a number of uh, situations where women in animal husbandry and milk farmers, mushroom pro producers, organic vegetable uh, cultivators, and women who uh, support in reforestation, they know their formulas. They know their solutions, but the solutions are considered to be local and uh, not good enough to be promoted as best practices. And as I mentioned earlier, access and control over resources, being a widow, being a, a, a female-headed household, access and control over resources is a major challenge because in, in our culture, men would own the land. Men would, most of the time, men would have the land in their name. So women going to get microcredit, women going to get uh, support in the farmer community, they should show that they have access to land. Ownership. Ownership is a major challenge in our context. And uh, in terms of uh, community action coming together, especially as, as mentioned earlier, female-headed household intersectionality is a concern which restrict women from getting into meaningful participation. So meaningful participation along, if you take a value chain in a rural community, uh, the, the communities which uh, we work with, the women who may produce milk, uh, we see different levels of involvement, milk collectors, there are women who would take them to the uh, distributing centers, the, uh, in a particular setup, we know of a woman who has gone to school only up to the fourth grade, mm -hmm. but a perfect coordinator for her function. And uh, then this value at the dif at different levels of the value chain, their contribution is quite efficient and effective. But in the in the standard system, they may not have the same recognition as achievers in their own system. So availability of time of these most marginalized groups, as I mentioned earlier, poorest of the poor, and a widow, a female-headed household, a woman from a female-headed household, all these are having greater challenges in getting involved and assuring meaningful participation in these uh, processes. And also uh, policymakers ignore women's voices. As I mentioned earlier, we have not when there are solutions scientifically. Mm -hmm. But life learned lessons are not recognized specifically because women are poor and it is coming from women. Mm -hmm. So you see greater marginalization. And inter the intersectionality is one uh, very important factor to be considered in these uh, women's empowerment programs. Well, your, um some of the comments you've just shared have really linked so nicely to the Sunshine's statement before about lived experience not being recognized. And um, you know, even when you look at the way in which we're invited to provide comments on the draft political declaration, for instance, it's not coming from the perspective of lived experience, it's coming from, you know, you need to be backed up by scientific knowledge or backed up by international um, human rights instruments. Sunshine, um, with that in mind, Carla has also spoken about intersectionality. Is this a lens that um, Vidya takes and to try and address some of the barriers that certain women um, or gender diverse people are facing to, when they try and get involved in climate change solutions? Yeah, definitely. Um, our team is very diverse and inclusivity is a huge thing. And I think, especially with decolonizing the way we work, we are definitely pushing for more inclusion and recognizing that, recognizing to meet people where they're at. And that's a huge thing, I think, especially within climate change and working in the climate crisis, because it is a very, it can be a very draining um, process working within climate, especially if you're, working with people who have gone through climate disasters or just in general reading very dreadful statistics every day and I think 
FIDEA does a great job at supporting and ensuring that we are all supported and feel safe to do the work that we do. Thank you for drawing our attention back to the mental health impact um, of climate change and on it and working in the space. Um, Fernand, over to you again in Haiti. So we've spoken extensively about some of the barriers that uh, women are facing in your local community. Um, but I wonder if we can shift it from women as being vulnerable and try to see women as agents and survivors. How are they overcoming these barriers? What are some of the strategies that they're developing to um, overcome some of the patriarchal norms you've referred to? Um, Reminder, please turn to English on your translator to hear from the Thank you, Fabien, sur Organiser Tetu. Dans ton temps, tu as une organisation qui est une communauté moyen, mais pour qu'on y ait une famille pas active. Et la famille qui a participé à l'éboisement, tu as mis tes têtes ensemble pour que tu as fait une organisation pour que tu as fait une organisation. Women no, know no, very no, well no, how to organize themselves. And we had an organization um, a long time ago, but now it's not really active. But a long time ago, we had this organization, this women organization, where women used to participate to replant tree. And they wanted to plant coffee. So, you know, as you know, coffee is a plant that needs a lot of um, shade. So they put themselves together to plant those trees who will able to provide this shade. And I think that it's very important for women to put themselves together and work together. And I think it's the first one of the very, one of the very important things that can make them face this And when we participate more in economical activities and decisions which are taken, we, we are able to make our voice to be heard and it's helping us to face those barriers, those challenges that we are facing. Thank you, Fernand. Um, that example you provided of women um, finding a solution to getting shade to grow coffee trees is really, really, really um, very powerful. Um, Rubina, in terms of Pakistan, how does it feel, how does it make women in rural communities feel to be called vulnerable or to be called, constantly called victims? Is there a need to perhaps look at them in a different way um, so that we can really highlight their agency and their resilience when it comes to climate change and some of the patriarchal barriers that they're facing? Yeah, well, the first thing which we really need to understand and which women have been have been um, uh, learning and you know um, somehow admitting that now this is the time to make a shift from a victim narrative to a leader narrative, mm -hmm. and uh, this is uh, I would love to share the example of uh, girls rather than women, for instance in Lower Deer. School girls and one of uh, one of uh, one of the girl is she's eighth grader. She she's just talking about you know the climate change, how it has been affecting girls and women, and particularly the girls. So the first thing which women have been using, as you can say, the strategy to overcome these barriers is just talk about climate change. You know, if we don't change, uh, you know, we we can't change, and uh, but we never discuss and uh, we have to form local uh, climate change groups to start conversation and this is where, what we 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 have seen and witnessed in uh, in very what you can say far flung villages of pakistan so now the other thing is like we all talk about leadership women leadership uh, you know like presence of women in uh, a structural presence of women are the visible, uh, you know, presence of women in uh, structures, decision making structures, mm -hmm. structures. But one thing is very important for rural women, and that is the visibility of leadership. 
sometimes we do have women leaders but they are not visible and you know they their visibility because of the lack of their visibility they could not reach up to the high level policy dialogue as you can say dialogue forum in, in provincial capitals or the capital or other uh, high level forums and uh, how to make the women visible this is what um, somehow uh, I, ngos i ngos and even the government they have been providing spaces to those women where they can exercise their leadership for instance the ministry of um, human rights they on 8th march they introduced some of the women who have been using um, uh, you know like alternative uh, uh, cropping they, they are doing or uh, they are doing the mixed cropping so when they put their stars you know the people from from different uh, uh, policy making the structures they were there they visited their stores they met the girls rural girls who have been um, initiate, taking different initiatives to raise their voice so this is what that first of course we have to um, increase or we have to enhance or we have to develop the leadership and leadership doesn't mean just mm -hmm. among the women leadership is also the nurturing of leadership among girls and women and then the second thing is to and uh, to make the women leadership more visible at all levels and how uh, media maybe media social media or some other forums they can they can introduce those women at the bigger or the greater uh, better, uh, platforms and this is what all about building the resilience to adapt climate change and women have been doing they have been uh, you know they have been taking wonderful initiatives they have been also somehow breaking the barriers when they travel from the lower deep and come to islamabad to share what they have done so this is not only they have been exercising their leadership but also making their leadership visible and this is what um uh, I, I mean, somehow they have given the strong message to policymakers that this is the time now mainstream um, gender in all climate change program and policies, and uh, they have to take, they have to, uh, they have been advocating to ensure gender sensitive investments in programs for adaptation, for mitigation, for technology transfer and other capacity building programs in different provinces of Pakistan. Yeah. Thank you, Rubina. I liked what you said at the beginning about shifting from that victim narrative, and you've really provided some examples of how women are taking the initiative to try and assume leadership positions, even if it means traveling across country to reach the capital. Um, Carla, in your um, communities in Sri Lanka, do you find that this victim label or this um, vulnerability label actually fits the women that you work with? I think uh, what we experience is women wouldn't be uh, vulnerable. They shouldn't be vulnerable. They shouldn't end up as victims. But unless and until you understand what makes you vulnerable, the marginalization connected to uh, the, the status of vulnerability, it's difficult to come out. Mm. So uh, what we believe is in terms of strategizing, as I mentioned earlier, our processes are addressing to change the conditions as well as to establish long-term sustainable solutions, which is about changes in the status. To do that, a, a woman not, might not, she might have to walk for miles to get fetch drinking water because of the changes in the climate, which is beyond her, whatever the uh, reach. Now, uh, digging a well would be to change the, the condition around her, but not her status. So what we believe is vulnerability should be understood very clearly in order to strategize, in order to address the practical and the strategic needs towards uh, reaching gender equality. And uh, Unless you do that, you would get victimized forever. The interventions would be very much welfare oriented. 
It's like uh, uh, giving alternatives or solutions for a given moment. So what we believe is uh, development sector interventions are calling for women's leadership in this area. By addressing to the, the, the practical needs of the moment and also targeting long term sustainable change. Thank you, Carla. It's very, um, the example you provided about providing the well, it actually made me think quite, you know, there's a lot of efforts. We, in order to be gender responsive, we have a lot of band aid solutions. Let's give women more options. But to what extent are they really, really transformative and leading to changes in those harmful? discriminatory social norms that actually create these huge enormous barriers for women in the long term. Um, Sunshine, from in terms of the Indigenous women and diverse gender folk that you work with at FIDEA, do you feel that that label of victim or vulnerable actually resonates with them? No, I, I like the word resilient. We're all very resilient beings. And especially when talking about decolonization and what indigenous people, even world indigenous people have gone through um, throughout the years. And so I, I, I resonate more with the word resilience and because I have met, I know, and I have read about women and gender diverse folks who work on every level to dismantle many walls of oppression that have been put put forward and progress looks different everywhere. So our successes would look different, but I think we all are working towards the same thing, which is equality. Thank you, Sunshine. Um, Fernand, so you were nominated by as a powerful leader by a community organization in Haiti. Can you share a little bit about your journey and about what barriers you might have overcome and what has really been your source of power and strength in your journey? Fernand? Okay. Is there an issue with the translation again? Let me get the job from you Aviv. I'm from your victim. Donc c'est ça qui bam force à courage pour me porter voix femme yo ali. Dans l'idée pour qu'a gagne un changement dans communauté là. Et m'a conseillé toute jeune femme avec petit fille qui veulent venir leader pour yo pas peur. Pour yo toujours devant. Pour yo croire dans capacité yo, pour yo croire dans propre force yo. We are booming now lead on changement climatique. I find my I find my strength to work and to find the, those climate changes by seeing all women in my community were living, by seeing how they were victims. And that's what gave me strength and motivation to bring my voice in this battle. And also I wanna advise all the young girls and women to, to believe in themselves. If they want to be leaders, they don't have to be afraid. They have to believe in themselves and they have to believe that they have a very powerful strength and a lot of capacities to fight against the climate changes. Thank you, Fernand. Self-efficacy, the sense that I have some control and power is really, really fundamental, I think, to any strategies that we develop. Rubina, would you like to share a little bit about your journey and what your source of strength and power has been in this journey? Yeah, well, uh, basically I am a rural woman. Uh, I born and raised in a village in a very agricultural area and a district that is famous for orange fruit. Um, and uh, well, being a woman and also belonging to a minority group and uh, from a very humble background, I, I have seen the world from a different perspective. I mean, to climb the mountain of oppression, not just the, that of the gender, but also the religion, culture and class as well. So now 
what was my strategy and how I move forward. The first thing is that I work simultaneously on enhancing or cultivating my human capital and social capital. When I talked about human capital, it's all about skills, it's all about knowledge. So it's like a dream that a, 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 a woman from a very, what you can say, background village got an opportunity to complete her doctorate from USA and doctorate in leadership studies. So it's not less than a miracle. So when we really, when women really have the kind of willpower and then they create their own space. And what I did, of course, my major focus was on education and to enhance my capital, my skills, my knowledge. And the second thing was like, uh, about the uh, about the social capital and i started from my within my own community at the platform of church and working with the uh, women group at the, you know at the platform of church and then it was my intention and it was i was very clear in my mind that from day one that this is not the this is this could be a step but this is not the entire solution to reach up to the policy um, making uh, you know structures and to raise their our voice over there so gradually i worked with the women from uh, different uh, religion like from intra faith approach to inter faith and then the third step was how to mainstream within the um, within the larger fabrics of society so you can say it was a kind of uh, development framework in my mind from personal development to financial de development. And I was the first woman in that entire region who got an opportunity to, you know, I started my career as a lecturer in chemistry. My first degree is in chemistry. So I was a lecturer in chemistry in, in government college. And then I moved to Ireland to complete my master's in development studies. And uh, I am a distinction holder. So. So you, you can see, you can't live with your vulnerabilities. Sometimes this vulnerability is your strength. You know, for me, being a minority woman was that I have the responsibility of my entire community to make my recognition within this community that being a minority woman, we can contribute a lot. And this keeps me, you know, going, you know, and to take it, it to, to my destination. And um, of course, then I got uh, opportunity like when you are, then when you are have the, you know, human capital, I mean, when your personal development, you move to financial development, you have resources, then your strict, you know, social capital enhanced within the, um, within the community, buying capital, building capital, and then you can get access to the political development. And political development doesn't mean to representative in the parliament. It means that you have to be the member or representative of different statutory boards, different policy making structures at the local level and then at the provincial level. And for instance, now I am, I am the member of uh, National Commission on the Rights of Child and let me give you, as you know, make it, uh, you know, sometimes I think that it is, it is again a very, uh, very big achievement for a minority woman that the composition of commission is that we have four provinces in, in Pakistan and Punjab is one of the largest province, um, you know, more than 60% uh, population residing over in Punjab. And I am representing Punjab. I am not on woman seat. I am not on minority seat. It's a general seat. And so if you are sitting in this decision making structures, like how we can, we can see how the climate change is affecting girls, you know, if I am working with the commission on the child rights. So all these things, uh, which, which I have to again mention that development of leadership and visibility of leadership. And when women are sitting in these structures, they are more visible, They're, they can raise their voices with, you know, with more strength and I mean, louder and louder. And that's, a, that's really a change to, you know, to make this world more, uh, as you can say, uh, gender, uh, you know, gender neutral. Yeah. Mm. 
Rubina, thank you for sharing that as an incredible story. And just that phrase, translating how you translated your vulnerability to strengths is really, really very key. Um, Carla, would you mind sharing a little bit about your personal journey and what has been your source of strength, power and inspiration along the way? Uh, I grew up in a household full of men, a bunch of boys, brothers, and uh, my childhood was uh, spent with a bunch of boys. And my father was a school principal who was very progressive. And uh, all what they got, my father was, uh, he made sure that I got the same opportunity. I think his progressive uh, whatever the, the, the guidance given to me has uh, helped me a lot to be where I am today. And then now I live in a household filled full of boys. I am a mother of three boys. So I keep uh, watching them and uh, they keep watching me. And I know I'm trying my level best to tell them what equity and equality is. And on the other hand, I think my strength is working in diversity, managing diversity. I work with different groups, uh, the networking and my uh, background. I have a little uh, confusing background. I'm a lawyer by profession and uh, I teach uh, business administration. So, and uh, I have a little in uh, intellectual property rights. So that helps me a lot, but I made the decision not to join the private sector. I've been in the development sector for a long time where people keep on asking, you know, financially, uh, a different decision would have made life easier. I'm very happy today of my uh, decision, working with women, uh, watching, uh, uh, walking through all those difficulties with them has really empowered me. And, uh, and also some uh, mentors like Professor Swarna Javira, Dr. Kamala Piris, who believed that welfare would not support women to get empowered, who believed unheard should be heard through strategic interventions, making long-term change. They didn't use the word of sustainability. They talked about sustained empowerment, where uh, women empowered would uh, extend the same support for rest of the women in the community to make realistic change. So I think I learned, I watched these women, amazing women uh, who believed what empowerment should be. And they didn't know what logical framework were. Uh, they didn't talk about theory of change, but now uh, when you turn back and see what they have done, they have done everything what we talk and discuss within tools. So that is my story, thank you. Thank you, Carla. Um, lovely to hear the role um, of boys and men as allies in your childhood and uh, the, the importance of mentors, mentors in inspiring you. Um, Sunshine, can you share a little bit about your journey and what has been your source of strength and power? Thank you, yeah. So for my strength and power, I always like to try and acknowledge myself first because I believe sometimes as women and gender diverse folks, we often forget or minimize the strength and power we have within ourselves. So I do always like to try and do that. But I do think a big reason why I am able to do that is for because of my support system. I am very fortunate enough to have such a strong support system within my family, my friends, my workplace, and even within the Indigenous community. Thank you, Sunshine. Um, I don't think any of us would be here today without the support that we receive from our family and friends and communities. Um, so on that note, we are now turning over to our Q&A portion of the, um, of the event. There have been some really interesting questions that have been posed in the Q&A box, and my colleague is also collecting some of the others that have come in the chat. So many of these don't have, uh, they aren't for the attention of a specific speaker. So I'm going to offer it to one or two of you, and then we'll go to the next question. Okay, so the first question do you see women from different communities joining together or are they focused more on creating change in their individual communities? Okay. Um, Sunshine, would you like to take a stab at that one? I 
I'm just reading it in the chat really quickly. Okay, I'll pass it on to uh, Carla. Do you see, are the women focused on change in their own communities or do you see women getting together across communities or across countries in your work? Yeah, when you talk about a community, there is so much of similarity and commonness. So much of, uh, in, in terms of facing the challenges, common challenges being faced and looking for alternatives together is obvious. So we see communities, women in their own community trying to survive and trying to achieve working on their own as a group because their, their issues are very, very specific. But it doesn't mean that they stop from there. There are, we, we also we see so much of uh, interconnectedness between uh, different communities as long as their priorities are right. As long as they see that uh, a partnership with the other community would be advantageous in terms of advocacy, creating larger voice, working, working, uh, working towards their, their rights. So to answer the question, yes, you see more of uh, interaction and preferences in working their own communities, but that doesn't say that women would do not work with other communities. Now, we also have to understand, apart from uh, the environmental uh, factors, which are considered to be selling, actually, which are the challenges. When you talk about inter-community interactions, there are very many other dimensions as well, which would create mismatches, conflict, misunderstanding, which should be uh, uh, addressed, which should be looked at in coming up with com common uh, social mobilization processes. That is why in Sri Lanka, uh, say 1970s, UNDP introduced a program called Change Agent Movement. From every community, the, 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 the facilitators, the leaders were called the facilitators of uh, change they envisaged. So they are the ones who were mobilized with knowledge capacities uh, to make their own community to voice out their concern while uh, mobilizing the community itself to look for their own solutions. Solutions not, were not uh, implanted. So the realization, the synergy is by working together, underlining factor of social mobilization. Put aside all your differences, work towards a common goal. So there is always possibility and it is happening uh, inter-community interactions uh, on some of these uh, interventions. Thank you, Carla. <coughs> I'm just going to shift now to a, a, a second question. Uh, perhaps Rubina, if you're interested in taking this one. Do the panelists see the ability to scale up the valuable and successful projects you have mentioned and what is lacking in order to do that? Is it funding, external support, human resources or will? So what, would, what do you need really to scale up some of the projects you've referred to? Oh, you're muted. Of course, to scale up a project, we need two kinds of resources, human resource and financial resource. And human resource, uh, you know, when we, when we are working in, in the rural communities, uh, they do have uh, indigenous knowledge, local wisdom, you know, uh, but to get really the very scientific technical knowledge and to make a shift from, uh, from uh, traditional uh, knowledge towards the, you know, more scientific knowledge, it's a big challenge. And in scaling up, uh, we need really the, uh, the, that kind of experts. For instance, if women are um, creating organic, let's say organic vegetable, and they really want to, uh, to get the reasonable you know, cost of uh, the, the, those products, you, they have to start the online marketing, business marketing. But for that, they, they really need experts, how they can use all this technology and all the other. And this is, secondly, of course, what kind of soil and what kind of crop and the, you know, uh, the, all, all these are the requirements for the agriculture experts. 
Now, for both these things, you need resources, and those are the financial resources. I am particularly, specifically talking about the context of Pakistan. Now, the resources are uh, within the government. We, we do have resources, but these are, of course, insufficient. The second thing is like uh, to get the resources from the uh, private sector, and that's, of course, INGOs and uh, NGOs. In Pakistan, the process of getting foreign remittance is becoming harder and harder day by day. Like there are a number of, I mean, multiple registration process when you go with one process, then to other, and then, the, uh, you know, like three, almost three kinds of registration if you are getting foreign remittance. And that process is very much, uh, what you can say, time-taking and complex. So even if global community or international community or donors are willing to invite, willing to support these uh, rural women to bring that money into into the um, into the countries, is a challenge. So if we have to scale up all these uh, projects, uh, if we have to make up the uh, them the sustainable. Maybe we, we need to work in parallel with the government on policy issues, how we can take the support from international community, our donors to ease the process of registration for getting the foreign remittance. And we also need to um, generate our local resources and uh, the maximum utilization of local resources. So that's the other thing, yeah. Thank you, Rubina. Uh, we received a very interesting question in the chat, so we'll just dedicate one or two minutes to that before we close off to the event. Um, so this is, question was posed by a rural woman in India who spoke about some of the challenges that women face when they are having to travel. Um, so there's an issue there around infrastructure, a challenge that they face with um, access to banks as well as services, but largely about transport facilities. Um, and the burden that this, the, this, the additional burden this creates when they're also, they're caring for their households, but they're also trying to work or get involved in other activities. Um, have you found that um, other departments, for instance, or other sectors within your governments are focusing on like gender responsive transportation, for instance? or dealing with some of the larger infrastructural issues beyond simply microloans or microcredits to rural women. Uh, Rabina or Carla, do you have any response to that? Yeah, you know, in Pakistan, of course, when the women uh, to get uh, an access to the banks, there is not only the issue of transportation, but also the documentation. For instance, if you want to get the loan, you have to, first of all, uh, the first thing is that you have your national identity card. Then sometimes when you have to take the loans, they, they need some kind of documents to bring the witness or if you do have some property with your name. So, you know, just as a guarantee. So this is another uh, thing. Now, besides the transportation, of course, transportation is an issue. Besides that transportation is sometimes the families are reluctant. And I mean, the male member of families are reluctant. Now our women will go to banks, you know? So this is, this is the other, um, which you can say, resistance for the women. And, uh, but if the women are working in groups and if the group is going like four women, five women all together, then it makes uh, somehow easier and it will the confidence. So we have to be very innovative and creative when we come, come, come across all these kind of challenges. Yes, of course, the challenges are there, but solutions are also there, there to overcome all these challenges. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm conscious of the time, so I'm just going to hand it over. I'm going to thank all the speakers for the wonderful input, and I'm going to hand it over to Sean from Hope International to close off the session. Well, thank you very much, Joshua. Um, yeah, um, I'm the Director for Overseas Programs with Hope International Development Agency, and I want to thank CSW for uh, making this this event possible through the NGO platform as a program of their of their annual program. Um, I, I want to thank also just or, or just emphasize how how important the accessibility of this uh, has been for us today. 
just namely, you know, having Fanantia from Le Quay in, in Haiti and her traveling four and a half hours to get to Port-au-Prince in order to speak at this event. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Carla, Dr. Rubina speaking to us from, from Sri Lanka and, and from Pakistan and, and Sunshine speaking to us from Northern BC who otherwise would not be able to participate in this event, which is held in New York. Um, also just participants as well. I mean, we've got participants from Cameroon and Romania and India. And I've got my daughter behind me, uh, who, who's 11 years old and is, is being inspired by everything that is, that's being said. Um, uh, Joshua, thank you so much for your amazing ability to, to moderate and connect all of the discussion um, and, and all, of, all of the other organizations, uh, organizations such as Bailey and, and, and Anique. But lastly, and, and not least, uh, thank you all the speakers. You are amazing, you're inspiring, you're powerful. Uh, and it has been wonderful that you've been able to make time in your in your days and your evenings uh, to be here with us today. Uh, so I, I really appreciate all of the work that we do with you. And of course, I continue to look forward to all of the amazing work that you will do in the future. So thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you, Sean. On that note, I'd like to thank everybody for attending our session and for your patience as we dealt with some of the technical issues with the translation. Um, and I would just like you to wish you the best of luck um, as many of you are dealing with more events over the next few days and it has been wonderful to connect with you and learn from all of you and uh, that's it from me. Take care. Thank you. <laughs>